Great. So anyone can share this link, which is wonderful. Uh, and maybe we'll, we'll get started. I'm pretty sure that I'm recording, which is great. So we'll capture everything we talk about today. Um, okay, let's get started and others will join us and uh, with my apologies for being late and having technology um, challenges. <laughs> So welcome to you all. Um, Beck is not able to be with us this morning, um, but we will hear her story in some other format and I really look forward to that. Um, so the purpose of this webinar and the purpose of the 101 Open Stories is to capture during the year of open as many stories in as many different formats as we can from people in the open community. So as people have been sharing their stories in written form, uh, and we've been posting those on our website. So hashtag uh, 101 open stories, 101 open stories, and hashtag year of open, uh, and we're gathering those. And we thought it might be fun to try um, the more modern format of uh, a video as well as part of our storytelling. And thank you for agreeing to come and to tell your stories. Um, I would say 10 or 15 minutes or so for each of you just to share uh, anything you want to talk about really, but what I have found really interesting in recent conversations has been how in the world did you get into open in the first place? Um, uh, what was your educational background or your work, professional work life that brought you to being an open advocate and working in open education? And there's some, been some really great stories about that. So maybe we'll start with you and just al possibly alphabetically. Um, and we'd love to hear about how you came to be an open advocate. Thanks a lot, Jenny. Thank you for organizing this. Well, I will go back many years. <laughs> so start when, I, when I did my master's thesis in uh, animal science and food sciences, and that was in 1986. Um, just after that, I became a researcher at the Danish Meat Research Institute. And that is a very, I've worked in a very complex area, you could, uh, interdisciplinary area where we both have to look into the farm animal behavior, ethology, physiology, and, and also the meat quality, because there is a, a direct link between how you handle animals and their stress level and what kind of, of meat you get after the animal is slaughtered. So I was working in that field and that was uh, an interdisciplinary field that was starting in the end of the 80s. So I was there from the very first beginning uh, and because of that I have got a huge international network within that field that, uh, with people that I still collaborate with. One is Temple Grandin, I don't know if you've heard about her, this American woman who, who is quite famous as a film about her, a movie about her. Uh, we worked on the welfare of animals uh, in the Danish slaughterhouses. So what we did was that we were, I was quite a, convinced that we need to educate people, uh, farmers, staff, uh, transporters, but we also need to educate uh, like vet students, uh, uh, animal, sci uh, animal scientists and food scientists about the, these links, very complex links. Uh, but in fact, we also need to educate the consumers and the citizens. They have to know how we treat our animals before they become food. So, um, and, and then I found out that this research institute, they classified all this information as confidential. So I couldn't get the information out, which was very frustrating. So I left the Research Institute and uh, some years later, I got a permanent position in the Swedish University of Agricultural Sciences. And there, from there, I had a platform to start educating vets, uh, food science students, etc. In, in this very complex and, and you could say wicked problem as it is. Um, and I also um, did a lot of, my students did a lot of uh, projects. I involved them. They were very, uh, very much involved in uh, uh, conducting different projects within the food industry. And in some cases, the students were even involved in the statistics of the results and, and also in the writing of scientific papers. So in this way, I started working more openly however i was very frustrated because all information 
uh, in courses, etc., were was closed behind passwords because we used a VLE that had, well that was password protected. So. In 1998, I started to combine social and natural sciences. Uh, so I worked with um, the ethicists in uh, Scandinavia, but also with Peter Singer and Tom Regan. I don't know if you know these uh, uh, philosophers. Uh, Peter Singer is quite famous. He has written the book Animal Liberation, for example. And I invited them to Sweden and we started working on uh, we involved the students in making narratives about uh, how we handle our food animals. Mm -hmm. um, and I became more and more interested in what we call critical pedagogy, uh, which is like you would reject the neutrality of uh, knowledge and, and uh, that teaches in inherently a political act. Um, and um, I also became more and more involved in uh, sustainability issues. So I started to develop role play games in which students could develop their own uh, stories. And they were OERs and, and, and had a, a license, uh, a Creative Commons license attached to them. Uh, and, and it was around, in that, at that time, I was invited by Fred Mulders, who I knew before, um, to join the Godian family network. And that really opened doors. <laughs> I became more and more um, uh, in, both involved, but also I got this huge and lovely network. And uh, I understood that, well, there are lots of people around the world working within this uh, area. Um, I also came to think of uh, making more robust knowledge. We need to have a dialogue uh, about, with the consumers and with the citizens. And that was the reason why I started some projects where I, um, I opened up uh, information and, and got the students to collect videos, etc., from and within the, the industries. And I, I have told this story before, but it, 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 it um, became very controversial uh, and um, uh, it, it happened that uh, the industry were very annoyed uh, because they really wanted to protect this uh, information and didn't want these uh, videos to come out. Um, this is a long story, but I will stop it here. Uh, but anyway, when I, when I did my uh, PhD in, um, in open education, uh, and I, I, I got the position as a senior lecturer in high, of higher education uh, pedagogies in Gothenburg University. Again, I got a platform not open, not only to talk about uh, this, the subject, but also to be more of an advocate for, for open education and openness. So I'm involved in a, in a part of my, um, my uh, university which works with the uh, scholarship of teaching and learning and uh, and in this way i can i feel i can i can spread the word uh, i'm also an editor of a journal um, a springer journal about food ethics and again i see that we need all the time to advocate openness because springer journals they are not open access. No, they're, they're not. Access, et so uh, we all need to fight for openness. And I'll end, I will end this story about my, um, my, my, yeah, my history and openness by saying that um, I have all the time um, uh, focused, uh, I have been with the problem in focus, try to tackle um, absence of restriction um, and, and trying to make uh, things more participatory and, uh, and I'm really uh, convinced that the sharing uh, is, is important and I feel that it's a, a democratic process and, uh, and, and by enacting agency uh, it gives people possibilities to enact agency and also uh, for the creation of more robust knowledge uh, if we can accomplish a dialogue about um, these wicked problems. 
and um, I will end by citing uh, one of the member of the members of the Gaudian family, Rob Farrow, who says that open education is a cat catalyst for free reflection on knowledge, but also on pedagogies. I like that citation. Thanks a lot. All right, Anne, that is a great story, wonderful story. I do know. Um, the work of Temple Grandin, my oldest son, is on the autism spectrum, uh, and she's a very uh, vocal advocate for the, the capacity uh, of high-functioning um, adults on the autism spectrum. She's done some amazing work uh, with her talents, and so and I can see clearly see the connection to the, to the work that you're doing. Um, I also really love the aspect of uh, making sure that citizens and consumers and community members are are um, understand the knowledge and have more knowledge and i can imagine um, having lived in the growing up in the u.s um, in an environment where resistance to that kind of public information is enormous um, that even you know in in your context and in societies that are a bit more democratic when it comes to those things that the resistance must have been pretty well, challenging for you <laughs> yeah no well, you know but still uh, i had problems you know i too. Big fight with the industry here in Sweden. So, uh -huh. it, um, but but I'm very happy that it ended up being open and it's still open. Um, so yeah, that was Great. a good act on me. Yeah, very good. And just one quick question about so how how are your how are the students receiving this idea of openness? Are they are you know are they really fully embracing it and and sharing their work and their knowledge as co-creators as part of this? Uh, I. It's a good question. Uh, in Sweden, um, like everywhere, of course, students want to be involved. However, the, um, the, the, the whole openness uh, discussion is not very well known here. Uh, we have a big job to, uh, to advocate that. Um, so, so the whole uh, open education trend is quite unknown to people here, even to the students. Right, I find that's very much the case here in Ontario, Canada as well for me. So awareness um, being sort of one, the, the number one job for any open advocate um, as, as I've heard from so many before. Thank you very much for your story. And I'm gonna move on to, uh, to Bea next, I think we're going alphabetically. <laughs> uh, hang on, I was muting myself, can you hear me? Yes, yeah. Okay, cool. Um, I, I must say I haven't really, it was, it was just now that I was kind of trying to reflect back as in when did I start doing open, so I'm not as prepared as Anne was. Um, so what can I say to you? I was, um, so my background is in, in languages. Um, I'm really a linguist at heart and um, I started teaching, so I'm Spanish, obviously you know that already. And I started teaching um, Spanish with the Open University in the year 2000. Um, so why do I go back that much? It's like it's 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 it was very exciting. Um, so it was all teaching distance education and all that, but it got really really exciting for me around. I don't I don't remember exactly. It must have been maybe 2002, 2003 when when we started doing everything online. So what happened was that I, I no longer met my students face to face, but all tutorials so, um, happened online, which which uh, was very very exciting. I said because it's not it was the first time that I was doing something like that. So you're actually teaching Spanish and helping other people speak Spanish. And um, the system we were using at the time was very much um, it was a it was synchronous communication, but you couldn't see each other. So you couldn't really see your students. My students couldn't see me. So it was a very interesting way of communicating and. and I loved it. I basically loved it. Uh, so then after that, um, I started kind of doing research on exactly that topic. So basically what happens when you're teaching online and people can't see you? What, how does it change your, your way of teaching, basically? And uh, so I got a research grant to move to Milton Keynes. At the time I was, I was in Ireland. Um, and so I, I, around, I think it was 2005 that I moved to Milton Keynes to do my PhD and I, there was nothing to do with open is it was just basically all about how do you communicate online and um, so as part of teaching 
with the Open University, when we started teaching online and we started using this specific system that the, the university had created, uh, what happened was that the Send, you got a set of materials, so you could, for your tutorials, you could, you know, you could prepare your own materials, but in case you were stuck or you, you wanted something to work on, the central academic team in Milton Keynes sent you a CD, basically, with some materials that, that you could use. You could just use them as, you could create your own materials, build on those materials to use your, 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 you know, to give your class your tutorial. And um, so that's how it all started because then at some point, somebody said to me, uh, they asked me, well, do you create your materials? And I say, yes, sometimes I do. I just grab your things and I grab your ideas and I basically think of what it is that I need in my class. And then I, I might actually use what you give me, but change it and all that. Or I might create something from scratch. So they said to me, well, how would you feel, how would you like to share those materials that you created? And I said, yeah, super, great, fantastic. You know, I have no problem with that. Like, you know, yeah, how, how do I do that? Um, and it was basically then, and this must have been around, say, I don't know, maybe 2009, 2010, when they introduced me to Loro. And Loro is the Languages Open Repository. So basically, the, the idea was that um, if I was to say I was teaching Spanish and I was teaching the beginners course, I got my CD from the university with materials for teaching the beginners Spanish class, right? But um, I didn't know what the intermediate class or what the advanced class materials looked like because I wasn't teaching on those courses. And it's the same thing. I mean, uh, because I was teaching beginners in Spanish, I knew what the beginners Spanish materials were, but I didn't know what the Chinese were doing in class or what the uh, German beginners were doing in class or what the French beginners or the Welsh beginners. I basically didn't know. So, so that was the idea for the languages repository. It's like basically they put all these materials online in a repository for people to access. So if you wanted ideas on what to do in your class, you didn't really, you didn't really just have access to your materials in Spanish, but you had access to all the other materials. Mm -hmm. So the idea was then, you know, not only to have the materials um, that the Open University had created, but invite tutors and invite the rest of the world actually to, to upload their own, their own materials. If you did a version of um, you know, a class using the OU materials, you could actually upload your own class and all that. So that's how it all started with me. It was like, how would you like to share your materials? And so somebody talked to me about, um, they started talking to me about uh, Creative Commons and what the difference was, uh, you know, this is something that you created and then you tell people how you want them to use your materials and all that. So from then, <laughs> just to make a long story short, from then it evolved into for being a user of a user of um, of the repository. I actually moved on to doing a bit of research on the repository and helping other tutors use the repository. So I would talk to them and say this had the advantages. Um, you know, this is this is how we do it. So I'm talking about again open licenses and all that. And so from then, I moved on to working with SCORE. So SCORE was the support center for open resources in education, and it was I think it was an initiative within the Open University, I'm not sure if was it funded by DISC, I think Martin could, could probably confirm this, but my role there again was to help people, people who wanted to share um, how, you know, my role was to help them, help them to share and in particular using um, what is now called Open Learn, uh, Open Learn Create, it used to be, it used to be called something else, but it's the, that part of Open Learn where you can actually the space where you can actually create your 
your own materials and create your own courses. So my my role, part of my role with the score was to help people to to use uh, open and create and and again to you know expose their materials to the world and and uh, share it with 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 other people. From then I moved on actually to work with Martin on a small project uh, called Score Microsites. What we were doing was um, we were doing we were trying to see whether we could create a whole curriculum for research students. So based on the students um, on on PhD, well postgraduate uh, research skills for students who were coming to study their their phd in the uk uh, but were come basically coming from outside the uk so we could we wanted to see whether we could put a whole curriculum together um so that in a way was kind of creating another repository of resources that that were openly licensed um at the time also this is we're moving now this is now 2012 we were doing we got another uh, project which was to do with it was the open translation MOOC. so we were just out of the blue we kind of said right can we how can we use open tools to actually teach translation so we had uh, again we used open learn create to to set it up um it was kind of crazy because we moved it from week to week we were kind of creating so if content was going to go live on monday we were still working on it on Sunday, on Sunday evening. So it was, um, and that actually was very exciting. We got like a group of like a community of people in Brazil translating, translating from um, you know Portuguese into English or the other way around. And we got another community in Spain, another community around it. So it, it was actually very, very, very rewarding. Um, and then eventually, how much, how much more time do I have? Eventually, oh, yeah, good. Keep going. <laughs> eventually, I started working for the Open Educational Resources um, Research Hub, the OER Research Hub, which uh, you already know it's it it's it, it was a project funded by the Hewlett Foundation to um, to basically evaluate the impact of open educational resources on teaching and learning. So we had 11 hypotheses. What we tried to do was um, was basically uh, see whether these hypotheses were, were true or, or, or false, all to do with the impact of, of using open educational resources in, in the class. Uh, so that's basically the core. That's when open got serious in the sense that before then it's, you know, it was it was kind of something I am not exactly on the side, but at this moment, like working in open education, in, in doing things in the open became basically 100% what it is that I was doing. I had to stop teaching, not because I wanted to stop teaching, I actually didn't want to stop teaching, but I, I basically didn't have any students. Uh, so I took redundancy from teaching. I haven't, that's very sad to me, so I haven't taught since. I'm sad. I want to learn Spanish from you, babe. <laughs> <laughs> we can set something up, no problem. <laughs> uh, so, and then basically from working with the OER hub, you know, it's when we kind of started, started expanding. So, so being a small team, because it was only, so at the time when it started, it was Martin, uh, Rob Barrow, Beck Pitt, whom you already know, Leanne Perryman. So it was a very, very small team, um, but then we, hopefully, we, you know, we, we started doing really interesting work and really great work. And uh, on one of these boards, basically, is the, the GoGN. So Anna mentioned GoGN. So we took over, so it was in 2015, I think, in, in Banff, um, during the Open Education Global Conference, that... Uh, that I first came across, uh, you know, I first came across GoGN. Marty says to me, just go over there because I'm just go to this meeting and see what happens. We knew we were taking over, but I must confess, I didn't really know anything about GoGN. So when I got there, there was this wonderful group of people, all PhD students, so kind of nice and innocent. And I say, oh, yes, I can do lots of things with these people. <laughs> uh, so it was, again, very exciting, you know. So. Uh, you know yourselves, the Global OER Graduate Network is a network of PhD students around the world doing their, their studies um, on an aspect of open education. And so we took over from, from, 
Rob and uh, Robert and Fred. It, it like it must have been the summer of 2015. I'm not very good at dates exactly. Which was um, not that long ago. <laughs> well, no, everything no. in open feels like it's been going on for 10 years, but no, I know, that hasn't. I know. And then, so and so after that, basically, it, it's just basically say 2013 really when it was. So I had to stop teaching. So I went into doing research 100% of the time and uh, just looking after Goji. And then we've worked in really either as a team or as an individual, we've worked in really interesting projects. So it's been the Explorer project, which is again a body was what. What I was doing again was um, working on a course to teach um, teachers how to reuse open educational resources. There's been the open educational practices in the Scotland project, where it is very much about yeah, what what does OEP mean in Scotland? Um, you know, lots lots of different things that we're doing at the moment. But I think that's I think I told you enough. Great, so that is a wonderful story and lots of really great stuff in there. Um, so similar to, to Anne's story, I guess I have a question about how do you feel it's going in terms of awareness, um, maybe in the context of Open University UK and the other work that you're doing? Do you feel like you're, you've made headway and that you're getting some traction? Well, we, um, the thing for me is that I really have to think twice about um, do we really want awareness? So if I go back and I think of my own experience, um, I was probably doing things in the open already without actually knowing anything about about open educational resources or about uh, open educational practices. And I think still that's 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 very much the same. So yes, because we keep you know we keep talking about it, we keep doing things, we keep bringing open even outside the university and, and talking to as many people as possible. Of course, the awareness is, is, is there, but um, that doesn't mean that open news wasn't there already, you know? So I, I don't really kind of in two minds about, about, um, about all this, but definitely, you know, we've, we've, we've come a long way. Um, we still have a long way to go, a long, long way to go in terms probably of, of still kind of finding the hard evidence that we need to say open education works properly. Um, you know, that's what I think. Or I, and I, you know, I think it's a really important point that there are so many people already doing this and don't call it that and don't, you know, they're just good teachers. <laughs> this is just how they go about teaching. Uh, and maybe it doesn't need to be labeled. Um, but I think it needs to be celebrated. And that's one of the things that, that, uh, that, I'm, that I'm seeking is, you know, just trying to, to encourage educators to kind of come out of the woodwork a little bit and to, and to say, you know, the work that you're doing and sharing with your students, reducing their costs, you know, to the whole spectrum of open um, is wonderful. And, and you're really great for doing that. So I think it's more than awareness. I think for me, I'm looking for celebration. Um, do you find that the that the element of support for educators? So, if you know, if part of your work covers the spectrum of of supporting them and how to do this and how to find things, is that what, being well received? It is. It is being well received. And see, anyone, it's like it's like what I'm saying. I'm not teaching Spanish anymore, but at the same time, I'm actually helping people to do things. So I'm not exactly teaching how to do things, but definitely that support is. It's just so 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 important, you know, because we sometimes take for granted even. You know, even like just the, 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 the very simple stuff as you know, well, how do I? Yes, I take, I, I always ask people, okay, when you go on holidays, do you, take, um, do you take pictures of your food, for instance? Well, you know that, that actually for me, um, as, as a teacher of languages, that, that is actually very, very valuable, you know, and mm -hmm. I can take those pictures in my class. So just something I said, I said well, do you put your pictures on Flickr? I said, like, well, how, how do you do that? You know, so if you actually sit with somebody and, 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 and you show them how to do things, they'll, they'll keep on doing it. They'll, they'll do it a second time and all that. So support, you know, that's very much what I've been doing from my, from my, my time working with, with the Laura team. It was very much about explaining to people, this is what, what an open license means and this is how you can do things. And, you know, without that support, I, 
a lot of people would actually just, you know, you just don't bother. You don't even think about it. The, 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 the possibility, the potential doesn't really, you don't think of it as in, you know, yes, I would like to share my stuff, but it's not part of what I do every day. So if somebody supports me in doing that, that is just so, so important, I think. All right, excellent. Thank you so much, Bea. I think maybe we'll move on to Martin and see how we do with our hour. And if we have more time to talk through some additional things, it would be great. Um, okay, Martin, you're up. Now, can you hear me now? Yes. Hey, okay, yeah, good idea to try with that headset. So you might right. get some feedback then. No, it's pretty good. Thank you, Martin. Okay, good. Um, so, um, Mine probably goes back even further than Anne, so put back into the mists of time. Um, so I'm going to come at it from two angles, I think, so it might be a bit rambling. So um, one is kind of like my professional disciplinary practice, and the other is the kind of personal practice. I think those two have now sort of merged. So um, on the kind of disciplinary professional side, uh, I launched the OU's first um, e-learning course back in 1999. Um, and we had like 15,000 students on that course and it was like a big deal. And so um, I sort of became the, the OU's e-learning person um, to go to. And so we started looking at different models for that. And so one of the things I got involved in was with um, a colleague, John Norton, who was interested in, in open source projects. Uh, and we started, at the time, we were, this was kind of before OER existed and stuff, and we were looking at this idea of... Um, an open source approach to teaching. It's very much based on the idea of you know, why do we replicate everything? You can just use the same principles you apply to open source to teaching materials. We tried doing that. Um, and in some ways I regret we didn't push through with it more and get funding for it, because it was kind of very much what OER was about. Uh, that idea of you know, uh, given enough eye, uh, eyeballs, all bugs are shallow kind of thing, you can produce really good content. And that kind of got me into the whole learning objects approach. Um, so I met people like uh, David Wiley, Sort of pre-OER, um, for those of you who were into learning objects, they were kind of the, uh, the OER precursor. And so we did lots of work around that. And I, I was, uh, I chaired the first course that went into the uh, UK e universities project, and which was a disaster of a project, but that wasn't my fault. <laughs> but the, their platform was based around um, learning objects. So learning objects were kind of these reusable components that, that were standing independent where the other people could take and adapt. That kind of got me into that whole kind of uh, world, and then OER came along, um, and then Creative Commons uh, licenses came along. Shouldn't we have a way to share this stuff and license it before? Um, so then I was part of the team that worked with Hewlett Foundation to get the grant together for um, in 2006 to launch OpenLearn. So we launched OpenLearn. Uh, I didn't have a lot to do with OpenLearn then, but um, once we got the funding in, so. So that was kind of a shift into the proper uh, OER world, if you like. Um, and then about that time, um, so I'd been the VLE director, LMS director at the OU, uh, and also still kind of got involved in open source approaches there as well. But I also got interested in the whole idea of blogging then, and more in, uh, when Web 2.0 was still a phrase we used without embarrassment. So I started uh, getting a lot into that kind of stuff. So. Um, started blogging sort of earnestly in 2006 and using a lot of those other tools around then and we could have this big utopian ideal that we're all going to create our own content and share it and it'll be lovely so the slide share youtube all those kind of things for sharing content um and i got interested in the idea then of uh, impact new technologies upon digital uh, upon scholarly practice so um i wrote a book in 2011 called the digital scholar um and i think it, in reflection, I mean, I always should say there are kind of three components that come together around being a digital scholar. It's kind of digital network and openness. Uh, but actually I think it's probably openness that's the most interesting out of those things. You know, you can produce all your PowerPoints and lock them in a drawer and that's kind of, it's digital, but it doesn't really change any practice. So it's really the openness that's interesting. So really that book probably would have been better labeled the, the open scholar, I think. So, um, so I kind of got into the whole mode of kind of, sharing by default then and, and interest in licenses and what happens when you do this stuff uh, in, in the open as it were. Um, and then, I, and then um, as I mentioned, we started getting into um, sort of more focused OER projects. So um, particularly the Hewlett 
uh, foundation's grant for uh, the OER Research Hub, um, which kind of brings those things together then. Um, and uh, I've become that kind of guy, so um, for, uh, I don't know if people, does everyone have the phrase like to, to the man with a hammer, everything looks like a nail. So that, <laughs> I was that guy with openness. It's like, well, if we go open, that'd be better. It's like, <laughs> that used to be my thing in every meeting. Well, if we did it openly, that'd be better. Um, and it isn't just a kind of blind kind of altruism that does that. It's like, you know, it just, so I used to be the person who used to be, go along to give talks about, you know, everyone should become a blogger kind of thing, a kind of evangelist. And I think certainly my tone in that has changed more recently with kind of, We've seen some of the darker side of that, but even so, a lot of that was based upon just seeing how beneficial it was for me as an academic to operate in, in the open. And I, and I appreciate, you know, that's yeah, as a as a white male working in a fairly non-controversial subject. It's, it's a different experience for me often to work in the open is for a lot of people. The things just like um, so just you know, having been a blogger, you kind of regularly record your thoughts and you get feedback from a really good community often. And I'm, so I haven't written two books now, kind of in the open, as it were. I, mean, I didn't mean to write them in the open. I was kind of just blogging. And then after about a couple of years of blogging about digital scholarship, I thought, oh, there's, there's a kind of book in there. Um, so when I started writing that book, I went back, sort of went through all my blog posts. And I had like about 30,000 words on the subject. You know? I mean, and it wasn't, you couldn't use them verbatim because um, you know, they've written, a blog tone is very different to a, a book tone and style of writing. But you kind of had, chunk of stuff there to work with and also when I went back there was loads of really good comments there with people sort of pointing to stuff this kind of thinking in the open and getting feedback and being open to feedback is I felt often found very productive you know it's like I think as long as you say I'm not sure that I've got this right but I'm thinking this idea through and people are often very kind of generous and helpful in thinking that stuff through so kind of this general open practice has been um, a, a way of operating personally and then when we got the OER hub grant we really made that a kind of central theme for for getting that grant and how we operated for it. So the, the, the team, uh, Bay and, and Rob and Beck in particular, have really made that part of the practice. So we blog regularly, we release all our data openly, um, we developed open courses on how to be an open researcher, released our survey questions under Creative Commons licenses, and we worked with other projects and, you know, in a very open way, and we kind of saw that as you know, part of what we were doing. Um, and again, it wasn't just because you know, it's a good thing to do, or that it is a good thing to do. Um, it was also very efficient and practical. So we started that project with nine collaborations, I think, um, and ended it with 15 because we kind of gained a reputation as, as the project went along. People said, oh, I've got data that's interesting. Oh, we're doing research in the area. Do you want to link up? So it, kind of, it was a really good way to kind of build the, the impact of that, of that project. Um, and then in 2014, I think, uh, I wrote a book called The Battle for Open, um, so which was kind of about the whole idea about what happens when open practice starts to become part of the mainstream. And I was there, I there sort of looked upon uh, open access publishing, MOOCs, OER, and open scholarship as sort of four strands of things that were sort of moving into the mainstream. Um, and you get different kind of constraints and conflicts and tensions when you start to move into the mainstream, which is an area I think is still worth exploring. Um, and again, I think just there's a kind of meta thing about, so, so the Digital Scholar and the Battle for Open were both published uh, under an open access license. Uh, the first one by Ubiquity Press, the second, no, the first one by um, Bloomsbury and the second one by Ubiquity. And just having a book in the open is also a very different thing. As soon as you accept that you're not going to be rich off academic publishing, which you accept pretty quick. So I'd written two books beforehand, um, you know, and they don't make you any money. So, you know, the whole point is that you kind of want to distribute your ideas and it's much, and they kind of have a different life cycle when they're open. So, um, so a couple of examples, for instance. So um, I didn't have a PDF copy of The Digital Scholar and someone found a copy for me on one of these book pirate sites that someone had created a kind of video <laughs> of my own book, which was great then, because I could just share it. And, and, but also I've been in a couple of kind of discussions and things like say on the Guardian Higher Education Network, and someone's asked about a topic and there's a, a relevant chapter of my book and it, it's a bit kind of self-promotion, but at least I can just point them to that chapter and say, oh, you know, there's some stuff here and some, bit, some references you might like, rather than saying, feeling like I'm saying, please go and buy my book, which kind of always felt a bit. <laughs> too much you know 
So it kind of allows you to share stuff, but also just different things happen. So um, an OU colleague read uh, the Digital Scholar and said, oh, you know, I find it really useful for staff development. Why don't we create an open course from it? And at the OU, we run these things called badged open courses. They're kind of um, four weeks long, um, about three hours per week, eight weeks long, three hours per week. Um, and they're, yeah, eight weeks long. And they have a test in between. They're kind of very particular format. And we base that around um, the book. So we added a bit more materials and videos. But we could take just large chunks of the book. And because I, I own the copyright, but it's Creative Commons, you know, I don't have to go to the go to the publisher for my own content and get ownership back of it. You know. So it allows you to do different things, you know, and um, other people taking it, and, you know, adapt bits and, and rework it. So, um, you know, and it's one of the things that, you know, despite kind of, I think, realization of that sort of some of the dark sides of open practice, I think particularly in places like Twitter, you know, which can become, um, we've seen in the past few years, certainly not always welcoming, but there still are really good elements of open practice. And I still sort of come across them every day, you know, so, and it doesn't take long. I think there's a blog I've started reading recently and they're really good. It's like, and suddenly they're just like, you know, being out in the open really right, helps kind of part of the ideal we used to have and people like me to bang on about this is like it kind of democratizes space and i have this other talk with people about the paradox of open and that's true actually it does democratize space um, so some people who might be marginalized beforehand have a really powerful voice and because they're trusted you listen to them and and that can be through writing good posts blog posts but at the same time it's also true that it marginalizes people who are already marginalized and both those things are true simultaneously so it's a much more nuanced picture, I think, now than when I first started talking about the scholarship. You know? um, I'll stop there. All right, wonderful. Thank you very much for sharing your story. Um, I have a question about students. So um, I believe that you supervise a number of students who are working on various PhDs in the open. Um, how do you feel that that spectrum of teaching and learning has changed? Sort of, you know, the highest level of doctoral studies. What do you, what do you feel that Open has, has done in that spectrum? Is that to me or to everyone? Yeah, it's to you, Martin. Okay. Um, I, I think, think Bea does as well, I just, and probably well, Anne. Um, the example I always give is of my, which is now completed, my PhD student, Katie Jordan. Um, she's an excellent PhD student. Um, and so she was doing her PhD on um, academics use of uh, networks such as academia.edu and Twitter and those kind of things. And as part of her PhD, she wanted to learn how to use uh, data visualization tools. So she took a MOOC about data visualization. And for the final assignment of that MOOC, you had to create a data visualization. So uh, she did one, it all gets a bit meta here. So try, <laughs> I'm trying to explain it carefully. So she, for her final assignment of the MOOC, she found, this was back in 2012, she found all the existing data about MOOC completion rates and plotted them online using free open source software on her freely hosted blog, which she obviously shared openly and all the data was open. And this was picked up by Phil Hill of eLiterate, so that's kind of the most complete picture of MOOC completion data around. And MOOC completion was a big thing at the time, so saying, the MOOC's going to change the world. And, and, Katie was the first one to kind of plot all that stuff and find that actually you know, less than 10% of people were completing the stuff and bring it all together. And it kind of became the de facto piece to go to about MOOC completion rates. And uh, Katie and I got asked by George Siemens to, um, to put a bid in for some Gates research funding around it. And she published on it and uh, I think it ended up in private eyes, like the kind of reference piece. So all that kind of happens because Katie's operating in the open. You know, so if you take openness out at any point along that way, then it stops having that kind of impact. And even though it wasn't really the topic of her uh, thesis, it kind of you know, helped her public profile a lot and she's kind of you know, well respected and connected into that community now. Um, so I think those stories are quite powerful for PhD students. And, and incidentally, part of Katie's work was she found that the people with the biggest uh, academic networks were PhD students and professors. And I think that, the, this, that might be because the first group are kind of like, I've got nothing to lose and trying to find the way out. And the second group, the tenured professors, also have nothing to lose. And in the middle, you've perhaps maybe got most to lose. Um, but um, 
so I think it, it, it can be very powerful. And I, I always advise my PhD students to um, you know, start a blog and start you know, making sure you connect to the interesting people. So you know, they're the people who are doing the really interesting stuff. And it only takes a couple of interesting findings and one influential person to sort of tweet it out. And that really raises your profile within, within the, the community which you're trying to become part of. So that was a rambling uh, conversation. Great, super. It's a funny story. One of my early kind of, and it wasn't that long ago, exposures to openness was seeing your presentation, possibly with Jim Groom, about your work with Katie, where you were pre presenting on um, the different types of learners. So big orange bubble was a, was a visual learner and a big you know blue bubble was someone who worked with, who learned more from text. So that, that was the first time I had seen you present. Uh, and was very inspired about the work that you were doing and MOOCs in general. So I, it's your fault, I think. Was that, was that in the great ice storm of Dallas? It was in the great <laughs> ice storm of Dallas. It's all my fault. I'm mainly George's fault. So that's why, you know, I'm a GoGN member and an EdD student, among other, you know, among other things that, that influence and knock my path into a different direction, right? and uh, conferences and those kinds of presentations and the work that's in the open have all been big influences for me to be where I am. So thanks very much for sharing. Um, we just have a couple minutes left. Um, maybe Anne, I would ask the same question of you about graduate students and PhD work. How do you feel that open has kind of changed that spectrum? I don't have anything to add here because um, since I have swapped career, I have only been um, supervising uh, students uh, with uh, PhD students and master students within my previous area within food science. I haven't been doing that within open education yet, but I'm uh, expecting to get a PhD student soon. <laughs> That's great. And how about you, Bea? Um, I have. This is very. This is very funny. I have three PhD students. Well, actually, two EdD students and one PhD starting now in October, and none of them have nothing to do with open. So. <laughs> <laughs> All right, you you failed them already, babe. <laughs> no, I've been trying to. Uh, that's kind of that's a battle I'm still fighting. So, no, in terms of topic, they have nothing to do with open. It's it, that's kind of a completely different story. But I know uh, basically from the work that I uh, that like our work with with GoGN so I, I know very much about what GoGN people are, are basically uh, writing their PhDs on and um, yes I am you know the, the thing that we mustn't forget is like when you're doing your PhD it's like you're learning to be a researcher right so that so the, you're kind of learning how 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 it is that you do research and i think we we're doing quite well in in sense that um you know it's 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 this idea of um kind of communicating your research not just sitting on you know in your room sitting at your desk doing just thing with your computer and that's it but so one of the things that i miss um and this is as i said looking looking at what coach and people are are studying it's very much um Yes, we are using um, like open education as, as a context, but there's very few, there are very few studies there that, that talk about impact directly. And I would like to see more studies to do with um, exactly some kind of um, um, experimental work, some kind of hypothesis based work that says, this is what I think, this is how I'm gonna try and test my hypothesis and this is what's coming out at the end of it. I mean, the, the, in terms of research, the um, John Hilton's group, the open education group that, that he leads and he's open education fellows are actually doing very, very interesting work that's um, the kind of rigorous research that we need. Um, and I think, you know, a lot of this, this stuff that is coming out of, um, I mean, in general terms, I can't actually, you know, it's, it's more, um, it's it's more qualitative, more of a description of what's going on, rather than going in and look for that hard data and and, and just getting the evidence that we need to put forward to uh, policy makers, decision makers, and all those all those people. So if any if there are any PhD students out there uh, <laughs> thinking of doing a PhD, you know, just 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 think think in terms of a hypothesis based 
study um, and think about impact. That's what I would say. All right. I think, you know what, Bea, that is a perfect place to end our broadcast. <laughs> love it. Um, just, I love being on time. And I thank you all for your time this morning and your patience with a little bit of technical challenges. Um, I look forward to transcribing, captioning, and posting stories. Uh, and we have um, more stories this week. So tomorrow, July 25th, um, we are talking with uh, Maha Bali, um, Maha Abdelmoyam, and I hope I'm saying her right name correctly, probably not, Catherine Cronin, and Sukena Walji. Um, so, and Wednesday, Thursday as well. You can find that information on 101openstories.org, and you can also find that information on OE Consortium, one of our partners for this series of stories we're telling this week. So thank you all so much for your time, uh, and I really look forward to hearing more of your stories. Have a great day.